Russia's large-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022 propelled the latter to the spotlight of world affairs and put the Ukrainian Air Force in the center of a fight for the survival of the country. However, this is not the first time Ukrainian aviation is engaged in combat against Russian forces. Over 100 years ago, aircraft sporting the colors blue and yellow fought against all odds for the survival of an independent Ukraine. At the dawn of the 20th century, the territory of what is now modern Ukraine was roughly divided between two empires. In the west, Galicia, with its capital in Lviv, was a kingdom inserted in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. On the other hand, the rest of the country was part of the Russian Empire and possessed no autonomy whatsoever. The First World War would therefore turn Ukraine into a major battlefield. At the beginning of 1917, the Russian army, poorly commanded and supplied, was in great difficulty, with the German army inflicting bitter defeats in Poland and forcing the Russians to retreat to Lithuania. Things were better at the center of the front, with the Russian forces seizing part of Galicia from the Austro-Hungarians. However, the Russian imperial regime collapsed on March 16th after Tsar Nicholas II abdicated and was succeeded by a provisional government in Moscow. This led to the establishment of local councils, or Soviets, all over the former empire. One of these councils, the Ukrainian Central Rada, took power in Kyiv. On June 23rd, it proclaimed the autonomy of Ukraine, which is recognized by the Russian government. Russia was still at war, but its army collapsed in the summer of 1917 following a failed offensive. This allowed the German and Austro-Hungarian armies to counterattack and take back the territory lost in Galicia, bringing the front line back to the borders of 1914. Desertions in the Russian army were numerous, and chaos spread throughout the country. The Bolsheviks took advantage of this and, after an insurrection, seized power in Petrograd and Moscow on November 7th, declaring a ceasefire and beginning negotiations for an armistice with Germany. The Rada, a few days later, denounced the Bolshevik seizure of power and proclaimed the formation of the Ukrainian People's Republic, a territory in federal ties with the Russian Republic, before declaring its independence in January 1918. The new state, claiming sovereignty over the territory roughly corresponding to modern Ukraine, was recognized by Great Britain and France. The communist government in Moscow, however, did not accept it. It declared the members of the Rada outlaws and created the Ukrainian People's Republic of Soviets, a competing local power in Kharkiv in the east of the country. The Red Army then set out to conquer all of Ukraine, with the fledgling Republic improvising an army led by the military delegate of the Rada, Simon Petliura. On December 13, 1917, Petliura appointed Colonel Viktor Pavlenko as head of the Ukrainian Air Force with Lieutenant Colonel Vyacheslav Baranov as his assistant. Both were former officers of the Imperial Russian Army. At their disposal were some 330 aircraft of the former Imperial Russian Air Service from the Ukrainian and Romanian fronts, forming several squadrons. However, there was little to extract from this military potential. If, on the one hand, barely half of these planes were in fine condition due to shortages of all kinds, on the other hand, a good chunk of the pilots and mechanics, knowing the war was over, only aspired to return home. Therefore, when the aircraft of a former Russian squadron arrived disassembled by train in Kyiv, there was no mechanic available to reassemble the machines. Baranov was thus forced to negotiate this service with German and Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war. In the end, a dozen veteran pilots of the Imperial Russian Army agreed to put themselves under the orders of the Rada and create the first Ukrainian aviation squadron at the end of December 1917. This turned out to be the only air unit capable of engaging the Red troops marching on Kyiv as it bombed enemy armored trains and artillery. However, this resistance was insufficient to stop the Bolsheviks from taking the city on February 9, 1918 and the Rada and its air force had no chance but to flee to Zhitomir. The new masters of Kyiv, however, did not benefit from their conquest for long. 
The Germans, tired of armistice talks dragging on, launched a vast offensive toward the east on February 18th. Codenamed Operation Faustschlag, this allowed Germany to seize Estonia, Livonia, parts of Belarus, the whole of Ukraine and parts of Russia in 11 days, with practically no opposition from the crumbling Red Army. The Bolsheviks were then forced to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and recognize the loss of the conquered territories. Occupiers of Ukraine, the Germans began dealing with the Rada, which had returned to Kyiv. However, since the Rada was reluctant to obey the imposed directives, Germany promoted the coup on April 29th led by the former general of the Russian army Pavlo Skoropatsky. The Rada was dismissed, and Skoropatsky began ruling the newly created Ukrainian state, also called the Second Hetmanate, as the Hetman of Ukraine with the support of conservative circles and the landed aristocracy. While Skoropatsky and the Second Hetmanate would only last eight months, this period without conflict due to the German occupation made it possible to develop the Ukrainian administration and to structure its armed forces, including the Air Force. A flying school, already opened in Kyiv during the time of the Rada, allowed the Ukrainians to train a few pilots and to constitute four squadrons. These were based in Kyiv, Chernihiv, Kharkiv and Odessa. There were also two aviation parks in Kyiv and Odessa, while regular postal routes were also being organized. The equipment for these endeavors came from the recovery of the stocks of the demobilized Russian army. 189 planes were seized, but only half could be restored to fine condition. The local aeronautical industry, namely the Anatra factory in Odessa, could have been called upon to provide the fleet with new aircraft, but it was requisitioned by the occupying Austro-Hungarian army, which reserved all the meager production for itself. Most symbolically, it was during this period, following an order of May 13th, that the Ukrainian national insignia, the Trident, was added to the fuselage of aircraft whose old roundels and fins were repainted in the national colors blue and yellow. The summer of 1918, corresponding to the peak of the Ukrainian Air Force, would turn out to be a temporary success due to the proximity of the civil war in Russia. Although confined to the German occupation zone, this conflict would soon deliver a severe blow to the fledgling Air Force. Kept in his post by Skoropatsky, Baranov revealed himself a sympathizer of General Denikin and his troops occupying the Don region. Therefore, Baranov held talks without the knowledge of the Ukrainian government and defected to the White Russians, organizing the delivery by train of 20 aircraft of the Ukrainian forces and taking along with him a whole group of pilots. Baranov's betrayal considerably weakened the Ukrainian Air Force. Moreover, the situation completely changed when the German and Austro-Hungarian troops left the country after the armistice that marked the end of the First World War in November 1918. Skoropatsky did not survive the departure of his protectors for long, and was driven from power by an uprising in December, resulting in the restoration of the Ukrainian People's Republic. The country was now run by a board of five ministers led by Volodymyr Venuchenko, who moved to Kyiv. However, since German troops were no longer in the region, the effects of the civil war in Russia were to be felt by the Ukrainians in full force. The Bolsheviks attacked Ukraine from the northeast and recaptured Kyiv on February 2, 1919. Venuchenko resigned and was succeeded by Defense Minister Simon Petriura who relocated the government to Vinnytsia. In the meantime, the white forces, advancing from the dawn, seized all of Crimea and a big portion of the Ukrainian coast, including Odessa, while the anarchist troops of Nestor Makhno controlled the northern shores of the Sea of Azov. The territory controlled by the Ukrainian government was therefore reduced in March to a strip formed by the cities of Zhytomyr in the north, Vinnytsia in the center, and Mykolaiv in the south towards the Black Sea, whose shores were controlled by the Nikin's white forces. Since this denied the Ukrainian nation any right to independence, there is no possibility of an alliance to fight the Bolsheviks. At this time, the Air Force of the Ukrainian People's Republic, again headed by Colonel Viktor Pavlenko, has only two squadrons left, one in Zhytomyr and another in Vinnytsia, with four and three aircraft in flying condition respectively. 
Their role during the fighting was mainly to carry out reconnaissance missions. Encounters with RAD or white aviation, which were very underdeveloped at this point, were practically non-existent. The dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire also led to the independence of many of its former provinces. This was the case of Galicia, populated mainly by Ukrainians, but with a considerable Polish minority. In November 1918, it acquired its independence as the West Ukrainian People's Republic, with Lviv as its capital. The president of this new state, Johan Petrushevich, began negotiations the following month to merge the two Ukrainian states into a single entity. This union came into being at the end of January 1919. However, this merger was a mere formality as the two Ukraines were waging wars against different enemies, which they kept on fighting separately. In western Ukraine, the capital Lviv had a Polish majority hostile to the new Ukrainian state. Following an uprising in the city soon after its declaration of independence in November 1918, Lviv was surrounded by Ukrainian troops. In response, Polish troops gathered around the town of Przemyśl, 45 miles to the west, and attempted to clear a corridor along the local railway line to rescue the insurgents. The newly created Polish Air Force worked to maintain contact with the insurgents until the Polish army managed to reach the besieged city on November 21st by freeing the railway line. The Western Ukrainian forces, including the small air force, constantly attacked this fragile supply line for several months. The air force of the West Ukrainian People's Republic was trained by Petro Franco, a former Austro-Hungarian air force pilot who received limited help from his eastern counterpart Viktor Pavlenko. By the end of December 1918, he had at his disposal nine aircraft, all based at the Krasne airfield, about 25 miles east of Lviv. These were six two-seater Albatros C and Hansa Brandenburg B-1 units that formerly belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Air Force and three new Poch fighters, models 21, 23 and 27, originally from the Imperial Russian Air Service. To improve the condition of the Air Force, Franco opened an aviation school at the Krasne airfield, and his men did their best to restore all the inoperative Austro-Hungarian planes collected from local airfields to airworthy condition. However, this effort was insufficient to maintain a satisfactory operational level, and Franco thus decided to recruit mercenaries in Vienna. He ended up crossing paths with the Polish delegation led by Stefan Stetz, who had also come to the city with the intention of boosting his own air force. Thanks to the presence of foreign pilots, the strength of the Western Ukrainian Air Force rose to about 20 aircraft at the beginning of 1919. These were divided into three squadrons carried around Lviv, from where they executed their aerial missions and consequently clashed with the Polish Air Force. On February 24th, a Polish Albatross C-12 was on a mission to Lviv when it was intercepted by a Ukrainian u -Pol. Flying the Polish machine was the Czech mercenary pilot Josef Tsagashek with Stanislav Pietruski as his gunner. The Ukrainian plane fired and hit the Polish aircraft, with Pietruski retaliating by firing from his dorsal machine gun. The gunner could only fire one burst before he was left with the handle of his weapon in his hand, but it was enough to do the job. The Ukrainian machine began trailing smoke and retreated before crash landing near the Lviv fortress. This was the first aerial victory in the history of the Polish Air Force. There was another aircraft claimed near Lviv. On April 29th, Stefan Stetz was at the commands of a Fokker EV fighter when he intercepted a Ukrainian two-seater Brandenburg C-1 escorted by a new Poch 23 aircraft. Piloting the latter was Franz Rudolfa, Stetz's former colleague from the Austro-Hungarian Air Force. The Polish pilot attacked the Ukrainian machine and was credited with shooting it down above Sokilniki, south of Lviv. However, Rudolfa and his damaged new Poch actually managed to escape through the fog and return to Krasne. Rudolfa would later desert on the same machine to Slovakia when the Ukrainians failed to pay him, dying of unknown causes in November. Still, these encounters do not paint a proper assessment of the situation. In fact, despite being vastly outnumbered, the Western Ukrainians claimed 16 aircraft shot down until April with nine of these victories being attributed to Serhii Yevsky. 
On the other hand, the Polish victory of February 24th was the only one the Ukrainians recognized. However, things took a different turn when the Poles achieved the aerial superiority, with these changes mirroring those on the ground. The Polish Blue Army, reinforced with equipment and troops trained in France, launched an offensive in May. The Western Ukrainian troops were pushed back some 75 miles east to the river's Bruch. Despite the counter-offensive, the end for the Western Ukrainian forces came at the beginning of June, when its remnants joined those of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Simon Petrura assigned them all to the east to counter the Russian troops, as the summer of 1919 saw General Denikin's White Army achieve numerous successes. As the Whites were even threatening Moscow, the Red Army was forced to withdraw from Ukraine and evacuate Kyiv without a fight. Ukrainian forces briefly recaptured their capital on August 30th, but had to evacuate it two days later due to the advancing white troops. By the end of autumn, the territory controlled by the Ukrainian People's Republic, which had lost all of its air force, only included the region around Vinnytsia. The Soviet troops, after defeating the whites, retook the lost ground in the city of Kyiv on December 12th. In an increasingly reduced territory, the Ukrainian People's Republic joined the enemy of yesteryear and signed the Treaty of Alliance with Poland on April 21, 1920. What remained of the Ukrainian forces would fight side by side against their common enemy, the Red Army. The alliance was successful at first, with an offensive launched in May enabling the Polish-Ukrainian troops to retake Kyiv. However, the city had to be evacuated on June 10, and in August, the reinforced Red Army invaded Poland and reached the gates of Warsaw. In the meantime, the partnership allowed Ukrainian aviation to be reborn from its ashes. The Poles were training around 60 pilots and mechanics, and gave their allies four Albatross J-1 ground attack planes and a two-seater LVG C-5, as well as two Sopwith Dolphins. Together, these machines, the last to be marked with the national colors blue and yellow until the 1990s, formed the Ukrainian squadron. This unit took part in the victorious Polish counter-offensive that drove the Red Army out of Poland and liberated Galicia. Parts of it, together with sections of Olenia, would be the only territories of modern Ukraine to escape the seizure by the Soviets as they were integrated into Poland. The Peace of Riga, determining the border between Poland and the Soviet Union, was signed in March 1921, with the Poles renouncing their recognition of the Ukrainian People's Republic and dooming any possibility of an independent Ukraine. Like many officials, the heads of Ukrainian aviation met a tragic fate. Viktor Pavlenko, who returned to live as a peasant in his native Kuban after a few years of internment in Poland, disappeared during the Holodomor, the Great Famine, in 1932. Petro Franko worked as a teacher in Poland before returning to the now Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. There he worked as a chemical engineer and was a member of its parliament until his arrest after the start of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. There are many versions for his death, but it seems most likely that he died on June 28, 1941, when he was either killed trying to escape his captivity or was executed by the NKVD. It would take seven decades for aircraft supporting the Ukrainian Trident to fly again. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content.